and welcome to our Tech and Sec Weekly. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the editor with My Security Media. Today we're joined by Dr. Alan McKay from the University of Sydney. He's a Deputy Director, Sydney Institute of Criminology from the Sydney Law School. And we're going to be discussing brain computer interfaces. Uh, this is on the back of Neuralink's announcement that they've just done their first human trial. And that was just announced last week. Uh, so, Alan, thanks for joining us. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, Alan, we're going to be looking more on the ethical and legal considerations around what we would call BCI or neurotechnology. Uh, yeah, just your general observations and interest uh, given uh, here in Sydney and uh, from a legal background as well. Um, so the, f the first thing to, to note when thinking about um, Elon Musk's Neuralink uh, announcement is that um, they're sort of... Uh, you know, there's an Australian company, for example, that's that's um, ahead of them in the path to regulatory approval. A company called Synchron, and there are other there are other companies, BlackRock, Neurotech, that have um, implanted um, neural devices in 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 the brain. Uh, so, um, I think the first the first thing is to know is that um, there might be some interesting engineering. Uh, Features of um, Musk's uh, device, uh, but but it, it sort of follows on a, another body of work that's been been going on for for quite some time. I, I imagine, as you say, uh, Elon Musk being involved grabs the international headlines. We first covered uh, this technology more from a cybersecurity context back in around 2018 where there was some 100,000 uh, implants already back then. So we're advancing quite rapidly. The other thing I do like with uh, this announcement is it came with a, there's a robotic implant, uh, uh, the R1 robot. And you can see uh, the different uh, companies that uh, Elon is involved with, with their Tesla robot and the like. He's bringing all of this very advanced technology into one and the interdependence. But maybe coming back to your observations on BCI and some of the legal considerations and, and uh, sort of moving on into the future because we are quite advanced in this technology. I don't think a lot of people realised how advanced uh, BCI is getting. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's, it's worth um, thinking about the range of... Um, so brain-computer interfaces are a kind of neurotechnology, but there's a kind of broader field of neurotechnology. And before... Uh, considering the legal and ethical issues, it's, it's probably worth thinking about the range of it. So, of course, one of the, um, you know, the important and really the most uh, wonderful um, application of neurotechnology is in, is, is in a therapeutic context. And so for a while, there's been um, brain implants to uh, address issues with Parkinson's. Uh, there's interesting... Um, forms of uh, neurotechnology that are now available and FDA approved and for clinical use, at least in America, from um, a company called Neuropace that has got a neural device that monitors the brain of a person with epilepsy and then using a kind of machine learning AI approach, it, it detects the neural precursors to an epileptic fit and it, uh, it st electrically stimulates to avert the fit. Uh, and it's it works well enough for it to F, be FDA approved in America, and it you know it works for some people who are maybe the medication is not working. So, and then you know um, if you think about um, um, Neuralink, like one of the uh, immediate applications for Neuralink is to enable a person who is perhaps uh, got some form of locked-in syndrome. Uh, you know, maybe something along the lines of um, uh, the great scientist Stephen Hawking's and can't can't uh, control their their muscle system. And now, um, you know, there are some people around the world now, a very small number of people that have uh, brain implants that uh, enable them to, say, control a cursor and control uh, maybe a robotic feeding arm or something. And uh, really, it's 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 um, important. Uh, to look at the the upside of neurotechnology, uh, you know, restoring health and autonomy uh, to people who, who who badly need it is is a, is a wonderful thing. So that's the therapeutic context. And then there's 
newer technologies that are used in um, other con contexts. So that's you know there's newer technologies to the consumer devices that don't re require brain implants, and they um, might um, be used um, in the context of gaming, online gaming. Um, uh, you know, like in America, they have um, there's a, been a competition in some of the universities for a while for brain drone racing. So people put on an EG headset, which is a kind of external form of neurotech that monitors their brain and they're able to gain control over um, a drone uh, and then fly this drone uh, without using a joystick or uh, using their body to control it. Um, and then there's a kind of military interest in it. So the um, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, the sort of um, kind of advanced research type wing of the American military, if you like, um, they've been looking at it in a therapeutic context to try and treat PTSD, yeah. but also, uh, you know, um, the military context involves the idea of kind of, um, you know, sort of super soldiers that um, perhaps don't need, can pay attention for much longer and don't need so much sleep, or they can perhaps control a drone swarm uh, whilst wearing augmented reality glasses, going through the battlefield with a weapon, and they don't need to use a joystick. And they've got this advanced um, um, intel about the, the uh, you know, the threat environment that they're uh, moving into. Um, so that's another context. And then uh, there's workplace context. So using EEG headsets to monitor the brains of a worker, say, let's say an air traffic controller or a driver of a heavy goods vehicle in order to um, alert them if, if, for example, they're um, starting to um, become, pay less attention or, and there's a sort of health and uh, safety um, dimension to that. I mean, of course, you know, like there's one, there's one uh, thought where uh, an employer monitors your brain to, um, you know, to avoid an accident. And you might think, oh, okay, maybe something like an air traffic controller, maybe that's, that's okay. And, you know, send them a message if they're starting to become less attentive. Uh, but then you can imagine other ones. You can imagine workplace um, monitoring for productivity, you know, to see if you're um, paying attention uh, to your, uh, your, your, your work and if you're productive enough. And you might think, oh, that's starting to um, become troubling. And then, uh, you know, like there's also now um, EG headsets. Again, this is an external... A device that's uh, marketed for the purposes of uh, criminal justice and security professionals uh, to um, uh, use to enhance interrogation. So the idea is that a suspect in an inter in interrogation might have one of these headsets on, and uh, let's say the uh, people, the security people, or the uh, police that are interviewing them, they show them a scene. Uh, let's say a crime scene or something like that. And the idea is that this device will detect uh, guilty knowledge. So if Signs, of before, sorry? Signs of deception, I beg your pardon. So uh, that's uh, really a, a new advanced polygraph, I imagine, if uh, into the future they may well have a court-approved uh, brain interface uh, connected to a suspect, I imagine. Well, the you know, the so the... These things are being marketed, and I, I understand that some security forces and police forces around the world are, are buying them. So, um, you know, <laughs> okay. it's, quite, it's kind of to detect guilty knowledge. So that's the idea. So, oh, you've you haven't seen um, you haven't seen the outside of my office. Uh, if I show you a picture of it, it will be different from if I show show you a picture of outside your office. You know, that's that's kind of the idea, and then. I think there's other ideas of you know which might be interested in the context of cyber security for authentic authenticating somebody you know by um, a neural device you know so maybe you you sort of hum a song that you like and this neural device 
detects that That's pattern. Good. They yeah. are. Right. We know who that is. Uh, and so, anyhow, um, that's kind of um, that's kind of a you know, there's a range of uh, possible applications. You know, like say, uh, you know, um, interacting with a home. You know, we we can't be bothered getting off our you know to change, get up and change the TV channel. We don't have to know, but you know, it, it might be possible to. Um, you know, do that with a neural device or, as Elon Musk said, summon your Tesla. Well, I think that's where it's either how invasive these devices are, how easy they are to have installed. And I think the other one is heading back to Elon Musk and his ultimate vision is to be able to upload and download memory uh, and those kind of things in, into the future. Uh, again, I suppose what are the, the the frameworks that you're seeing, the legal frameworks? Is this just another technology that we'll have to grapple with uh, in terms of that and uh, and how far behind do you expect the, the legal fraternity to be? Uh, I suppose the health side of these things are advancing the technology, but before you know it, it's a little bit like AI and all other technologies that become pervasive. So the answer is no, it's not, it's not just like other technologies. And one, one reason uh, for that is if you think about all the debate um, about, um, let's say the debate about generative AI and chat GPT last year. So the debate was focused on how, sh how should these things, how should the law regulate the development of these things and how should, um, how sh how, how should uh, it regulate the, the use of these things? But in the context of neurotechnology, even the word use is not quite the right one. You know, so let's say, um, let's say um, somebody's got a neural device, an implanted neural device, and it's really just part of the way they interact with the world. They regularly um, think uh, thoughts and use that to control external devices. They're not even really using it now because it's kind of part of them. And so one of the um, interesting differences from newer technology from other technologies is it involves a kind of uh, merging with technology uh, rather than using it. And, uh, you know, so you can think about merging with AI rather than uh, using it. Ilya Sutskever, who's the um, chief scientist at um, uh, OpenAI, and he was involved in the controversy about psychic out Sam Altman and so forth. He's been a bit quieter since then, but he did a lot of um, videos and interviews. And, you know, he, he made the point that, you know, like people um, will, he, he believes people will start to sort of think about uh, merging with um, AI. And um, Elon Musk, for example, he's uh, talked about uh, merging with an AI in order it's sort of like if you can't beat them join them this this technology is kind of um, mm. it's kind of a uh, threat in the workplace and threat to human beings business model if you like and so uh, you know like some people might be motivated out of curiosity or competition or whatever to to, to merge so so anyway the the answer to the first question is it's not like uh, other technology um, because it, it, it involves merging and okay, there's some merging already, you know, like I've got some fillings and that sort of thing and a little bit of metal in my elbow, but it's not, um, this is more like uh, a merging of minds. Um, so in terms of legal frameworks, um, the um, responses have um, started in, uh, they started in South America, really in Chile. So Chile was the um, the leading uh, nation to act on this, and they, they, at the end of uh, 2021, they had a big attempt to change their constitution in a big way, which failed. But they did make a smaller um, change to their constitution at the end of 2021 that inserted some text to the constitution that refers to protecting brain activity and data uh -huh. data from it. So it's actually in their constitution now. And it's not, uh, it doesn't just sort of sit there idly. So the first um, case has recently just been decided concerning um, a company that started in Australia, Emotive. Uh, um, 
and that uh, that's the, the first case that um, was decided by their top court at the end of uh, 20, 2023. Um, and now that kind of trend is starting to um, uh, take hold in other Latin American com countries. There's now a variety of Latin American countries that have got bills uh, that have some kind of um, response to the, um, I suppose, mainly the human rights, privacy, mental integrity, um, any any indications why South America in particular is taking the lead on this? And then, I suppose another question alongside that is the current uh, sort of focus on AI legislation. Is it something that BCI uh, consideration should be give, getting a, a, a sort of a seat at the table at the same time while they're looking at AI? They need to be thinking about BCI uh, as yeah. well. Yeah. So in terms of this, the Latin America. Th thing i mean so so one thing is the um so chile was chile started it uh chile's got great expertise on human rights partly because of their um maybe because of their dark history of the pinochet years the dictatorship uh, mm -hmm. they've got a, they've got a museum of human rights and that sort of thing so that may that may be part of it um there's also um, a kind of interesting feature of their constitutional range, arrangements called the Congress for the Future, uh, which is a kind of um, some sort of organization that is um, connected to their, um, you know, their kind of constitutional arrangements that is oriented to uh, looking at future challenges. Uh, it got a kind of champion there. G senator Guido Girardi was um, a senator. He's no longer a senator, but he he pushed it. Um, and then there's a, an American organization called the Neuro Rights Foundation. The um, Rafael Yust is um, he's a Spanish speaker, a professor of neuroscience at Columbia University, and they've been heavily involved in in advocacy and and they are elsewhere in, in in particularly in latin america as well and uh you know maybe these factors and then legal systems are you know like trends start in legal systems you know so um if you think about intimate image abuse or re revenge porn or something you know it starts in one jurisdiction then it, other jurisdictions yeah. start to, and that's been that's been happening in the common law jurisdictions, the English speaking ones, but they, I think the, you know, some of these Latin American jurisdictions look at each other, but no, it's, it's spread beyond that now. Um, and so bodies like the OECD, the Council of Europe, the United Nations Human Rights Council, they've, they've actually asked for um, a report on the human rights implications of neurotech. And there's now, uh, in an English language speaking country, a common law jurisdiction, there's the first bill now. There's a bill to, in Colorado, which has just been introduced, uh, which um, uh, aims to alter their uh, privacy laws uh, to refer to neuro data and that sort of thing. Yeah. So it's, it sort of start, it started a bit in, in, in USA now. Um, and um, so your, the other part of your question was, um, I know in Australia, there's no legislative response, but the human rights, uh, the Australian Human Rights Commission has been working on it and uh, they've made a submission to the UN and they're doing further work on it at the, at the moment. And um, the, in terms of the question is, uh, related to AI, I think that's a good point. And, um, you know, so not all neurotech involves AI, but it increasingly does involve AI. So the, like, the, the epilepsy device uh, uses a machine learning approach, for example. And the, the big developments recently in decoding uh, visual images have been enhanced mm -hmm. stable diffusion. Uh, and now there's... Um, now there is a kind. There's a company in the UK that's 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 uh, claiming that they are um, they've got a device that can just interact with um, Chat GPT. So you just think something and then Chat GPT answers yeah. it. 
So there's kind of a, there's a very clear connection with AI and increasingly uh, neurotech is a subset of AI. And I think uh, discussions of AI are, might be a bit deficient if they don't note that there's something different from using AI from merging with it. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose one last thing uh, from the Sydney Law School. Uh, what, what's your framework there uh, here in, in Australia and the, uh, the University of Sydney? Is this a, 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 a school of, uh, of learning that you're doing and research or is it just sort of a subset of law uh, that you have personally taken in, input? Where's, where's the University of Sydney sitting with this? So I've personally taken an interest in it and I sort of got onto it about six years ago or something. I started, I used to work in, I did a lot of work in neuroscience and law. And then when I learned of brain compute interfaces and I, I started working on that probably about six years ago. And I've sort of tried to sort of drive it a bit. And we all, I'm very pleased we, at Sydney Law School, we organized, uh, this wasn't easy, it was kind of an online event during the pandemic, but we, I think, organized maybe the first major conference on newer technology, criminal law and human rights uh, during the uh, during, and we did that during the pandemic with speakers from around the world zooming in. Um, and the, but there are others at Sydney Uni. I mean, you know, Sydney Uni is quite strong in um, biomedical engineering. And, um, you know, like some of the um, biomedical engineers are working on neurotech um, and they've, they've been involved in events um, that, uh, you know, that, that I've, I've, I've had a role, role in organizing. And so um, I think it's probably also worth mentioning that, um, you know, like Melbourne Uni should be noted here as well, uh, because um, the company Synchron uh, that um, is, is, is uh, very, very successful in, 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 in uh, brain compute interface company, and they're now headquartered in New York, I think, but they, they came out of the University of Melbourne. Uh, you know, so I know Professor uh, Nick Opie, who's, um, he's, he's, a, he's a professor at the University of Melbourne and involved in Synchron. Um, and just generally in, in Australia, there's, um, Australia's got a good sort of biomedical in engineering. Yeah. And there's loads of little startups. There's loads of little neurotech startups there's some, you know, larger ones like Saluda is quite a big one, a uh, reasonable size. Um, and then there's lots of tiny little startups and there's a lot of venture capitalist interest in, in uh, tech right now. And just on that, we interviewed uh, Stephen Sheila last year, who's the former CEO you of know, Facebook in Australia with uh, uh, Omniessen. Um, where, where are these startups uh, sort of, coming from where where in the ecosystem do you find them are they are they sort of researching the bci uh, on the hardware software can you give a sense of uh sort of that ecosystem and their the basis of some of these startups i think some of them at least are from uh you know like the people who can develop these things are are, are um biomedical engineers uh, you know, so some, some of them seem to be, um, you know, maybe a biomedical engineer working in a university. Um, uh, but then some, some aren't, you know, I don't, I, you know, are like they, emotive, for example. Treatment? Are they tend, tend to be on sort of focusing on specific treatments for specific uh, sort of ailments or diseases or conditions? Uh, they tend to be quite specific in, in their approach? On, on the on the therapeutic side, yes, but then if you think about um, if you think about uh, Elon Musk's plan, so Elon Musk's plan is initially to enable uh, people with locked-in syndrome to um, interact with the world, but the uh, you know the the broad aims go beyond that. You know that's kind of seen as the first step, if you like. And Musk hopes to um, 
you know, to advance into other forms of therapy for other different conditions and ultimately for non-therapeutic applications. And uh, it, it may be that, um, you know, some of the uh, startups have got an initial condition in mind that's quite narrow and quite specific, uh, but then maybe they've got maybe they've got aspirations to um, go further if they get a, a device that is um, is approved and working. I think the last thing I might finish on is uh, standards. Are you seeing the development of international standards, either both from a technology viewpoint or the treatment yeah. viewpoint? And where would people sort of go to have a look at those? Yeah, so they're being. I, I'm involved in the uh, development of, um, you know, Standards Australia's input into the development of standards. So these standards are just currently being developed, and so uh, that's where we are at the moment. There's they're they're, they're, in, they're in development. Um, okay. Well, the I first think, one I looked at was uh, was NIST in in the US, but I imagine ISO. Uh, would obviously be looking at this as well. Um, yeah, you, just to finish there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think, I think maybe another thing that we didn't touch on that's probably worth noting is the thing that you you mentioned earlier as well. Um, you mentioned uh, security, and uh, of, of course, you know, uh, uh, you know, some people have said that uh, you know there needs to be a sort of specific area of neuro cyber security because of course these devices um, interact with the outside world and so they can be they can be uh, hacked and um, you know say to 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 put on my institute of criminology hack you know you might think <coughs> there's something quite different from uh, hacking into um, a neural device and trying to say manipulate a person's perception or something like that from hacking into Westpac, and there might be need to, there might need to be new forms of criminalization and maybe new forms of specialization in terms of um, the cyber cyber security profession mm. that um, that work in in these areas. Was well, definitely from the data side, but you don't want sort of ransomware attacks and shutting people's brains down uh, in a ransomware attack. So I can imagine exactly. worst case, worst case scenario uh, that could potentially be on the cards, where uh, you can really cut off a, a data stream uh, yeah. to someone who is reliant on a device like that. Look, it's a fascinating uh, field of technology, uh, and one of the things I look at is that the crossroads between. Uh, humans and technology and this is really at the forefront of that and uh, so Alan McKay uh, from the University of Sydney Deputy Director Sydney Institute of Criminology from the Sydney Law School thanks for raising uh, this as a, as a topical point of discussion given Neuralink's uh, latest uh, human trial so thank you very much for joining us on our Tech and Sec Weekly. Thanks again for the invitation I enjoyed it thank you. Thanks Alan.